Good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. It's awesome to be with you. So glad you're here with us. And uh, I want to say hello to those of you on our online campus. Thanks for joining us there. And uh, anybody watching in our cafe, I love that you're joining us from there. And uh, anybody in our parent viewing rooms, that's a great option. If you do have small children that you prefer to keep with you during the service, uh, that is so helpful to use one of those rooms. And I love that you're joining us there as well. And uh, real quick, before we jump into the message this morning, a couple of... uh, small housekeeping items. Uh, One is uh, next Sunday, we're doing water baptism. And we're doing it out at BB Lake. We do some of them here uh, during our worship nights. But in the summer, we love to do one outdoors at the lake. And so next week, uh, service ends uh, at uh, 1130. And by 1230, we'll be out at BB Lake at the public beach there. And uh, we have nearly 30 people already signed up. And I want to encourage you, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus and you haven't yet been baptized in water, this is a great next step. And here's what's awesome about it is uh, the idea behind water baptism is just because of Jesus, I've been made new. That's the whole thing. And so uh, it's not like uh, you don't graduate, uh, you, don't, you don't come up out of the water with a halo over your head. Uh, there's nothing magical about it. Or, uh, it's really just this way of saying when Jesus died and was buried, <clears throat> and according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead and he overcame death. And so he invites us to follow him. And as a result of that, we can actually experience freedom from the things that are bringing death to us. And so we identify with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. So when we go down into the water, it's a way of saying, I'm burying that old me. The old old way of thinking, the old way of living, my old identity is buried and gone. And now I'm rising to new life and I have a whole new identity uh, as a part of Jesus' family. And so uh, nothing that you do to behave your way into that but it's a great way to celebrate the change that Jesus brings. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you haven't been baptized, this is a great time to do it. And, uh, and if you have been baptized, join us at 1230 at BB Lake and cheer on all those folks that are getting baptized. That's going to be a lot of fun. The other thing is uh, right after this service, we do something every week after every service called Five in Five. It's just this. No matter how long you've been coming, Whether you're new, whether it's your first time, or you've been coming for five years and you want to learn more about Westbridge Church, this is the fastest way to do it. Five in five is five things about Westbridge Church in five minutes or less. And we do it after every service right down front. So immediately after this service, you're like, I'd like to learn a little bit more. Five in five. Five things, five minutes or less. That's our pitch. So uh, I want to encourage you to join us for that if you're looking for more information. Now, uh, today is uh, starting a brand new series called You Matter. I came across this book several years ago uh, that is called uh, Life's a Little Instruction Book. It's one of those fun little books that most people keep in their home library uh, next to the toilet paper and hand towels. And uh, it's filled with little inspirational quotes for living. They're all just like these little one-liners, things like, watch a sunrise at least once a year. You're like, no. Or have a firm handshake. Just little little quotes or wisdom. And, uh, And what's funny about this book is that some of these sayings, when read together back to back, might not make the best advice. For example... Number 65 says this, let people pull in front of you when you're stopped in traffic. Okay. Uh, Number 66 says, don't make the same mistake twice. (laughs) So it's like, all right, I don't know if that, uh, this one, I think, you know, it's great wisdom at taking a loan. Number 74 says, eat prunes. You're like, oh, it seems good for your health and keep the plumbing flowing, right? And uh, number 75 is ride a bike. (laughs) And I don't know if those two taken back to back are the best advice. Uh, number 119. This one's fun. Put a lot of little marshmallows in your hot chocolate. Oh, all right. That's, that's great. Uh, number 120. Learn CPR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And then I love this one. Number 226 says, when someone hugs you, let them be the first to let go. And then I thought, what if we both own this book? <laughs> it's going to get real awkward real fast. No, you let go. No, you let go, you know? And, uh, but there are a couple of pieces of wisdom in this book that are really insightful and that definitely ring true. For instance, look people in the eye and say thank you a lot. That's great wisdom. And so today, I want you to hear me say thank you. Uh, I want you to hear me say thank you for, for every single one of you who you serve and you give and you participate. And uh, over the last 17 years since we first started Westbridge Church, you've poured in your time and your energy and your resources and your effort, and you've just invested in this thing. And I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Westbridge started almost 17 years ago. And uh, when you think about it, it started way before that. We're just, we're just jumping into something that Jesus initiated 2,000 years ago. And the question I'm compelled to ask isn't, how in the world does Westbridge continue to survive after 17 years with me leading this thing? That's a great question. Uh, but another question, the, the question that I'm really compelled to ask, and really one of history's greatest mysteries, is this question. How did a first century cult, which is really what everybody saw this as in the first century, it was like, okay, there's this guy who's a carpenter from Judea, and he's like, he doesn't own a home, and he's never left the country, and he's never written any books, and he's never had a kingdom, and he just, he's like this kind of traveling rabbi speaker guy. He's, he's a cult leader. That's what they saw him as. How did a first century cult, birthed in the armpit of the Roman Empire, which is what Judea was, nobody who was a Roman officer said, I want the assignment of Judea. That was where you got sent if you did something wrong. And so how did a first century cult birthed in the armpit of the Roman Empire, whose leader was rejected by his own people and crucified, how did this thing survive and thrive in the face of violent and state-funded resistance? How in the world are we sitting here in St. Michael, Minnesota, 2,000 years later, talking about this movement that Jesus started? You could say it this way. How did it come about that a Nazarene sect would eventually be embraced by the very empire that for 300 years sought to extinguish it. For 300 years, the Roman Empire went after this, what they called followers of the way, the way of Jesus, and they persecuted them, and they actually executed many of them. And how is it that if you were to go to the Roman Colosseum today, that you would see this Colosseum, the ruins of the Colosseum, where they would have sport and games, and some of the games would be to throw followers of the way of Jesus to wild animals, to beasts, to watch them be torn apart, to burn them at the stake. And how is it that you can go to that ruins of that Roman Colosseum and above the entrance of the emperor's door, you will find a cross, the symbol of Christianity? Why is that? And it's a mystery that historians have pondered for centuries, and they all pretty much arrive at the same conclusion. Karen Armstrong, as a historian and an author, actually an atheist, and she's studied a lot about violence and comparative religions, and she actually writes this. She says that uh, against all odds... By the third century, Christianity had become a force to be reckoned with. We still do not really understand how this came about. She says there's just something about it, and we don't even understand it, but by the third century, it was a force to be reckoned with. And we don't know how it came about unless we pay attention to the stories and the accounts of the eyewitnesses who were there for these events and who tell us exactly how this unfolded those who saw and documented everything they experienced. And while it's amazing that we're sitting here in, you know, St. Michael, Minnesota, 2,000 years after Jesus was actually uh, lived on the earth and, and we actually know his name, what's even more amazing is that Jesus actually predicted that this would happen. He made this prediction. I'll summarize the story for you. It's found in Matthew 16. And Jesus and his disciples are traveling on the road. They're going to a, a, a region that's way far north, uh, Caesarea Philippi. And on their way, on the road, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you You know, like, what's the word on the street? What's the scuttle? What's the scuttlebutt? What do people say? And, and they say, well, some people think that you're John the Baptist. Come back to life. Because John the Baptist had been killed at this point. Some people say that you are one of the Old Testament prophets reincarnated. They think that you might be Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other Old Testament prophets kind of reincarnated. But they definitely think you're something. There's a lot of word on the street about who you are and what you're up to. And so Jesus says, okay, who do you say that I am? And one of Jesus' disciples, a guy named Simon Peter, he looks at Jesus and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, that's a, an incredible statement. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word for the, the Greek version that we call Christ. And so that's where we get Jesus Christ. It's a title. It's not his last name. And uh, it's, it's, it means anointed one. In both languages, it means the anointed one or the king. And so here's what Peter is saying. We think you're the promised one from God. We think you're the, the, the embodiment of God in flesh and bone. We think you are the chosen one that, that God has uh, anointed to be the final king, to set up his kingdom here on earth. Well, that's who we think you are. And it's this incredibly bold and profound statement. 
And, and Jesus kind of smiles and he looks at Peter and says, that was revealed to you by my heavenly father. And then he says this, he makes this incredible statement. Jesus says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter, upon this statement that you just made, this statement that I am the son of the living God, that I am God in the flesh, come to reveal God to humanity. Now, I'm going to build. And the, the word that he uses here is the word ecclesia. It doesn't mean a, a sacred building or a place. It actually means a group or a gathering or an assembly. He says, I'm going to build a group of people around this idea that I am God in flesh and bone. Come to earth to reveal God. And I'm going to build my church. And so we've come to adopt the word church. He says, I'm going to build my church and not even death will be able to overcome it. And so he looks at these guys and goes, guys, you're in the, you're in the ground level of a movement that is being started. A group of people are going to gather around this idea. That statement that you just made, Peter, or upon that statement, I'm going to build a gathering of people. I'm going to build a movement of people. And death's not going to be able to stop it. And my death's not going to stop it. And Peter, your death's not going to stop it. And James, your death's not going to stop it. And John, your death's not going to stop it. And it's going to continue. And it's going to continue. And they're looking around at each other, much the way that I think 12 of us who sat in a living room 17 years ago looked around at each other and thought, us? Like this ragtag group of guys, this is who you're going to use? Jesus, we kind of question your strategy here. Like, we're plan A and there's no plan B? This doesn't really ring true. Jesus, do you know what happens to people who start movements? Do you know what happens to people who start new movements? They're killed by the Roman Empire. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Roman Empire doesn't really respond well to new movements and revolutions. They tend to put people to death. And sure enough, Jesus would be put to death. And yet, this same group of people who were with Jesus that day would document why Jesus' death, the death of Jesus, was not the death of the movement. It's because Jesus didn't do what most people do when they die. Jesus didn't stay dead. That's kind of a big hinge point. And this is why this verse where Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and not even death is going to be able to stop it. It's my favorite prophecy in all of the scriptures because you and I are the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus predicted us. That's amazing. And the movement that Jesus launched, this church that Jesus launched, it's a new kingdom in the world. It's a completely upside down kingdom. It completely flipped the script on all of people's assumptions that they had about wealth and about power and about rights and about honor and about greatness. It's unbelievable. This thing that Jesus initiated, this new kingdom, this new way of living that Jesus initiated on the earth. I mean, the way that the world worked was if you had power and wealth, you leverage your power and wealth so that you can have more power and wealth. And if you didn't fall into that category, too bad, so sad. And instead, Jesus says, no, this is a, a new way of living. It's a new way of seeing the world. It's a brand new kingdom. It's actually an inside out kind of kingdom. It makes its way into your heart. And then as it changes you, it makes its way out to the people that you interact with. And it changes them. And that we would live lives that are so marked, so marked by this way of living that in Jesus' words, he would say, it's like you're the light of the world. And that when people see the way that you live, that they will actually see your good lives and they will honor God as a result. They will be forced to just go, man, the way that these people live, I don't know what it is. It's so different. The way that they love other people, it's so different. It's like they light up the world. It's like we don't really have any other way to explain this than they're reflecting something outside of this world. Jesus says, your good lives are going to so shine that others will see your lives and glorify your heavenly father. And then this king laid down his life for his subjects. Now, again, that is not how the world worked. Jesus stepped into a world where might makes right, and whoever has, you know, the biggest army, you do what you want. You take advantage of anybody else for your own benefit. And kings didn't lay down their lives for their subjects. They asked their subjects to lay down their lives for them, to build their kingdom and to build their wealth and to give them more honor, to give them more territory, to give them more power. And into this world, Jesus steps in, initiates this new kingdom where everything's upside down, and then he actually gives his life for his subjects. And he would then ask them to lay down their lives, not for him, but for each other. He would say, I, I want you to do for others 
what I've done for you. And I want you to love others as I've loved you. And that the distinguishing mark of this kingdom would be that his followers would do for others what their king had done for them. And so Jesus would say, I want you to love your neighbors the way that I have loved you. And then he'd say, I want you to love your enemies the way that I have loved you. And, and this way of living began to change the empire. In fact, people began to take notice. People decided this is a better way to live. There's a biblical uh, scholar who's written a, all kinds of books on Bible history named uh, Bart Ehrman. He's actually an atheist, but he studied biblical history, and he writes a book called The Triumph of Christianity. And here's what he says about how Christianity actually impacted the world, including Western civilization today. He says, Christianity not only took over an empire, it radically altered the lives of those living in it. He says, it's not just about the fact that it made a difference in the first century, and it made a difference in the first three centuries of the Roman Empire. It, it, it completely was a cultural transformation. He says, it was a revolution that affected government practices, legislation, art, literature, music, philosophy, and on the even more fundamental level, the very understanding billions of people had about what it means to be human. In other words, he's saying this, you know, there weren't billions of people at the time that Jesus launched this movement, but now billions of people around the world have a certain viewpoint. Like, why is it that when you think about one country invading another country uninvited and just attacking people and killing citizens, and uh, we go, man, that's just wrong. Why? Well, we just know that it is. That's just human nature that it's wrong. No, it's not. When Jesus came into the world, that's how the world worked. And nobody thought anything of it. You invade, and if you have the opportunity to invade, you do. And if it gives you more territory and more power and and more might and, and more prestige, then you do it. And if you're somebody else who's not even involved, you go, well, too bad, so sad, I'm glad it's not me. Or if you can figure out a way to leverage it for your own benefit, you do it. Why is it that almost collectively, almost internationally, we think, man, when somebody invades another country and kills citizens, that that's wrong? It's because of the long shadow cast by the way of Jesus. This, this movement that Jesus started this gathering of people around the idea that he's launching a new kingdom, it's impacted the way we live today. And you may not even realize it. Why is it that when someone steals from someone else, we go, man, that's wrong? Well, because that's just human nature. We just, we just all agree that it's, no, you shouldn't steal. No, it's not. That's not human nature. That's not even how the world worked when Jesus came into the world. When Jesus came into the world, if you could steal and get away with it, more power to you. But the idea that every single person is born with rights, that every single person is born with a value, that you ascribe value to people because they are created in the image of God, and therefore I don't steal from you because to do that would hurt you, and you're created in God's image. Nobody saw the world that way until Jesus came into the world. And now it's kind of just like, yeah, it's human nature. Well, no, it's not. It's a part of the long shadow cast by this movement of Jesus called the church. Any time that you just intuitively know this is wrong. This shouldn't happen. We shouldn't do that. It's because Jesus came into the world and launched this initiative and launched this movement called the church. And this is what Bart Ehrman is saying. He continues and says this, however one evaluates the merits of the case, regardless of your background, regardless of if you're a Christian or an atheist or wherever you're coming from, anywhere in between, no matter how you sort of evaluate the merits of the case, no one can deny it was the most monumental cultural transformation our world has ever seen. When Jesus stepped into the pages of history, it changed everything. And it changed everything from a cultural perspective, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not. You benefit today, living in a Western civilization, you benefit from the long shadow cast by this Jesus movement. It's unbelievable. And if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're a part of the church, we are the stewards of that movement. We are, we are the stewards. The, the responsibility for this generation of the church, the responsibility is in our hands. And the faith of the next generation is in our hands. And we have a choice to make. We can either take from it and just consume it and leave it weaker than when we found it because we got what we needed from it. You know, I'm going to heaven when I die and my kids are going to heaven and my grandkids are going to heaven and I kind of like this preacher over there and I kind of like that preacher over there and you know, I get some good stuff from different parts online and it's great. And let me tell you something, if you're looking for incredible content, don't come here because there's way better preachers on the internet. There just is. They're all over the place. 
And the truth is, uh, you know, I like this preacher and that preacher. I'll take a little bit of this. I'll take a little bit of that. And I'll just kind of consume what I need and make sure my life is good. But I don't really have time to engage. I don't really have time to get involved personally. We have a choice to make when it comes to this movement. We can either consume. We can either just take what we need and, and you know, kind of just, oh, man, get what we need from it and kind of pick and choose and not, not engage and not get involved and not get personally involved because, you know, I'm busy and I don't have a lot of time, but, you know, I kind of like to watch here and there when it's available. Or we can engage. We can lean in. We can say, you know what? This movement that Jesus started that I get to be a part of is too valuable to let it die on my watch. And we can, we can just engage and ensure that the message of the good news of Jesus doesn't just make a difference for my family, but that it makes a difference for my neighborhood, and that it makes a difference in my community, and that it makes a difference in this region, and that there's ripple effects all around the world. And do you know what all the experts are saying about the church in America? Every expert says this, and it's already happened in other parts of the world where the church has gone so far and, and we didn't steward it well. In parts, if you look at parts of Europe and you look at parts of Canada where it's just the church is dying and what every expert says in America is this, that the church in America is dying. And do you know who determines whether or not this statement is true? Do you know who determines whether or not uh, there's a strong and vibrant church here for your children and for your grandchildren? Do you know who determines whether or not the decline of the church in America will happen or not? We do. You and me. Because you are the church. This is a box. You and I are the church. You are our church. You are your church. The church is not a place you go to. The church is who we are. We exist. And the question is, will we be the church? Will we be the church? Will we be good stewards of this thing that Jesus began? Uh, will we continue to sacrifice our preferences for the sake of those who are far from God? Will we continue to say, you know what? Uh, we're not going to drift off course. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing. We're going to stay on mission. We're going to stay on message, not for our sakes, but for the sake that Jesus promised to build his church. And we get to be a part of it. And the church is not a place that you go. And the church doesn't exist to meet all my needs. We are the church, and we exist for the world. Now, this is typically the part where I kind of head into a funny story and try to ease whatever tension you might just be feeling in this moment. But today, I just want us to sit in the tension of that. And part of my responsibility as the pastor is to tell you this. You are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You're a part of this body of Christ. In fact, in the first century, uh, the Apostle Paul was writing uh, several letters to a group of people in a church in Corinth. And Corinth was this big, bustling, vibrant city. And it had all kinds of problems. The people in the church had all kinds of problems. In fact, uh, we have a couple of letters that survived antiquity. We have, uh, you know, if you, if you look in the New Testament, you have First and Second Corinthians. This is Paul's first letter to the people in Corinth who are called Corinthians and his second letter to the Corinthians. It, we know there was a third letter to the Corinthians as well, but we assume that, I mean, it didn't survive antiquity. It's possible they read it, got offended, and just ripped it up and never survived. But um, he writes to them, and he addresses all these issues, and they were a mess. I mean, they were a hot mess. And if you ever read 1 Corinthians, and you're like, he had to address this issue, and he had to address this issue, and this issue, and I mean, it'll make you feel better about your life. And it's amazing. And he writes in there, they had so much dysfunction, and yet they're doing their best. They're striving to, to follow the way of Jesus. And so Paul writes to them, and here's part of the letter, and here's one of the things that he really wants to get through to them. He says this. He says, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. All of you together are Christ's body. It's brand new language. It's this metaphor that Paul gives. And he says, you are the embodiment of Jesus in your local church expression. He's talking about the church collectively. He's saying not when people come and hang out with you, not you individually, not you as a couple, not you as a family, but when, when people come and hang out with all of you together in this thing called the church. And we all come into this place 
into this, into this box with four walls. And, and we walk in here and, and you know, we've, we, we bring all of our different baggage with us. We bring all of our past. We bring all of our different points of view and worldview. And we bring all of our different political opinions. And we bring all of our personalities. And we bring all of our, you know, all of that into one place. That's why going to church in person can be so uh, sometimes hard, but sometimes life-changing. Because here's what you got to do. You got to sit next to somebody who may not see the world the same way you do. And you got to sit next to somebody who might have a different political view than you. You got to sit next to somebody, and, and then you got to, somewhere, somewhere halfway through the service, you got to go to the bathroom. So you got to stand there and say, Excuse me, excuse me. You got to make your way out. And it's inconvenient and it's difficult, and I get it. And it's in, the, that's, it's in the, all of that that we go, But here's, here's the one thing we all have in common we're all connected because of Jesus. And what we focus on is not our differences, we focus on the one thing that unites us, and we're all a part of the body. Of Christ, And this is what Paul is saying to this group of people in Corinth, and he would say it to us. You're, you're, a, you're a part of the body. You're connected to the body. Each of you is a part of it. In fact, the body's not whole unless you're connected, unless you're a part of it. Well, I don't feel like a part of it. I don't really want to be a part of it. I used to be a part of it, but I just, I just prefer to consume content. Paul would say this. That's not really how it works. In fact, here's what he would write about this metaphor about the body. He says, if the foot says, well, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less a part of the body. And then he would use another metaphor. He says, and if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? Rhetorical question, no. He says, I, I, I want to be an eye. And if I can't be an eye, then I just, I don't want to be a part of the body. If I can't do what I want to do when I want to do it and when it's convenient for me, then I don't want to play. I'm just going to take my ball and go home. Paul says, that's not how a body works. You're a part of the body because you're attached to the body. That's just how it works. Each of you is part of the body. Now, think about this. Have you ever watched a show where there's a disconnected body part? You know what it is? It's gross. It just is. It, no, you, no matter how many episodes you've watched, whenever they show like a disconnected body part, you're like, ugh. And you know it's a show and you know it's not real. Or if you ever watched, you know, this happens in like spy movies, right? Or like Mission Impossible or something where it's like, we got to get into that secret vault. And the only way is with the thumbprint, but we don't have the guy, but we'll just cut his thumb off and bring it with us. And they pull it out of a bag and it's like all bloodied stump and you're like, yes, we got in. And, and no matter how many times you watch something like that, and even if you know it's coming, no matter how many episodes of CSI you've watched, here's what you know. When it comes on the screen, you know it's a movie, you know it's fake, but you're just like, oh, it's so gross, right? Here's what Paul's saying. Don't be gross. <laughs> right? A disconnected body part is gross. So don't be gross. Be engaged. Be engaged. Jump in. If you're not connected, then you're like a body part that's disconnected. And so you need to engage. And for some of us, it's time to re-engage. Re-engage. Jump back in. Get connected. Uh, now, get it. I get it. Life happens, right? And uh, three years ago, you know, three and a half years ago, we shut everything down and everybody went online. And it was like, man, this is, this, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I was like, this is nice. I was sitting at home on a Sunday sipping coffee and going to church. But here's what you miss, being connected to the body, being a part of the body. Now, I love that we offer online. It's a, it's a great opportunity to connect uh, when, when you're not able to be in the room. But man, there's something about being connected to the body. Can I tell you what typically happens around here in the summer? And I totally understand it. We typically dip in attendance. That's why we move from three services to two in the summer. And we'll go back to three in a few weeks here. And I get it. Here's why. You have 12 weeks. <laughs> right? That's it. It's like, we live in Minnesota. We all know this. It's like, all right, Memorial Day to Labor Day. I got to get in, uh, you know, graduation, uh, weddings, uh, vacations, cabin time, lake time, and then, and then it's over. 12 weeks. I 100% understand. I'm not throwing shade at anybody. I get it. I just, say that, I just say that to say this. In the midst of that, in our sort of summer dip, here's what I want you to know. We've had more first-time guests this summer than we've ever had in the history of Westbridge Church. P3. 
people walking through our doors for the first time going, I'm looking to connect with the church. That's unbelievable. Our summer dip in attendance is, uh, you know, we, we typically drop anywhere from 35 to 40% in attendance. I just go, yeah, it's Minnesota. It's, it's, it's a they're at the lake, they're at the cabin, they're at a wedding, they're on vacation. I get it. I'm not throwing shade at anybody. I, I totally understand. But here's what's amazing. I'm just telling you, in the midst of our, our dip, our summer dip numbers have been higher than what we've been in a regular school year. That's unbelievable. That tells me that we're in this area where people are moving to this area. You know this is a growing area, and we have an opportunity. And in two weeks, we're sending out a mass mailer. We're going to invite people to a series that will start right after Labor Day. And we're going to go back to three services right after Labor Day to that type of schedule because I want to make sure that we have room for everyone. And I hope we run out of room and that we have to get even more creative and start more stuff. But when all of these guests show up to Westbridge Church, when they walk through our doors looking for hope, looking for healing, looking to, for the good news that we have, we have this good news. And they walk through our doors looking for it. What will they find? My prayer, with everything in me, I pray, God, let them find, when they walk into this simple building, let them find an engaged body of Christ. Let them find a group of people that are a hot mess, that are just like, we got all of our flaws and all of our baggage and all of our stuff that we bring with us. But when they walk in and they experience, like in the midst of all of their differences, they focus on this one thing they have in common. And I, and I walk out and I go, I don't know about this Jesus thing, but that, that is the nicest, most loving, most caring group of people that I've ever met. And they focus on the thing that has connected them, not what divides them. And I want to go back and I want to learn more about this Jesus that they claim to follow. That's what we want them to find, the hands and feet of Jesus faithfully stewarding the movement that Jesus began. And what's at stake for us is way too big to just be content being consumers, just consuming. And, and I'm not going to beg you, but I am going to invite you. I'm inviting you to participate in something. I'm inviting you to jump in and to engage or to re-engage. And this is the invitation of a lifetime. Outside of what you invest in your family, that, that's number one. But number two is what you invest in a local church. Like, there is no other investment that is worth your time and your energy and your resources than the local church because the local church is the center of what God's doing in the world. It's the one thing Jesus promised he was going to build is a group of people, not, not buildings, that's just a tool, but a group of people gathered around this idea that God came in the flesh and that he revealed God's love for humanity. And we're to build our lives around that. And to the degree that you participate and to the degree that I participate and to the degree that, that we are engaged as the body of Christ, amazing things happen because wherever the body of Christ is active in the community, that community thrives. In fact, the language Jesus used is that his followers are the light of the world. His followers are the light of the world, that we would be responsible to light the way for others to experience the love and the grace of God. So our mission is simple been simple from day one. We are people helping people find and follow Jesus. If you ever wondered, what is the church about? What do you guys do? This is it. Okay? P-H-P-F-A-F-J. Just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? People helping people find and follow Jesus. Whatever we can do to help people find Jesus and then walk with people as they follow him. That's it. It's everything we do. We pour everything into all of that. And to help us with that, I want to give you, because, you know, my hope is today to inspire us, and we're going to unpack some of these things over the next few weeks, but I want to give you four ways that you can engage with Westbridge Church starting today. You can go, okay, I, all right, Jeremiah, you convinced me. I'm in. What do I do? What does that look like? Let me give you four simple ways. I'm just going to give you a broad, like, flyover of each of these, and then over the next three weeks, we're going to dive into these a little bit more and walk through them together. But... Here it is. Number one, I want us to do this. Extend a specific invitation. Now, as I said before, we're sending out a massive mailer to our community, and uh, I want to show you what this looks like. It's going out to like 90,000 homes. Check this out. Kind of looks like a magazine cover. We've kind of like used this branding. And the series is called For Better or For Worse. Don't just survive. Make your marriage thrive. Now, here's, here's, uh, we haven't done a marriage series here at Westbridge Church in over three years. And here's the feedback that I got the last time we did a marriage series from a few different groups of people. One was this. I've heard this before. 
Yeah, you know what? We've done because we did a marriage series once a year for like ten years. I've heard this before. I'll be back at the end of this series. I've heard that. I've heard this. Uh, I'm single, so this doesn't really apply to me. So I'll be back. Uh, I'm I'm divorced. This doesn't really apply to me. I'll be back after this series. I want to encourage you with this, I, and I 100% understand each of those comments. I really do. I also know every time that we advertise this topic of marriage to people in our community, people show up in droves. The calls that we get are like, hey, where do I register for the marriage seminar? (laughs) Because marriage is a pain point for people. And we just happen to think that there's a lot of wisdom in the scriptures that can really provide practical wisdom to help people in their marriage. We also think that when we strengthen marriages, we strengthen families, we strengthen the community, that we help people engage with Jesus. We help them find and follow Jesus. And so we're going to do this. We're going to send this out. And I would ask you this. If you find yourself in one of these categories, where you're like, ah, I've heard it before. Uh, I'm single, you know, so it doesn't really apply to me, which I would argue if you're single, never a better time to learn. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, or, man, I'm, I'm divorced. This doesn't apply to me. I would just encourage you with this. I totally get those. I would say this. Can you think of someone in your circle of friends, your circle of acquaintances, if you find yourself in one of those categories, would you just maybe think about this series through a different lens? Is there somebody in your circle of friends, somebody in your circle of acquaintances who could not only benefit from a marriage series, but who could really benefit from engaging with the body of Christ? And would you invite them? And would you be willing to risk that relationship so that they could experience the body of Christ for themselves? Would you extend to them a specific invitation? And the reason I say specific is because of this. We've all experienced this dynamic. You run into somebody that you haven't seen in a while, and you're like, oh, hey, man, oh, great to see you. And then here, here's, here's the conversation, right? It's like, we should really get together sometime. Totally, yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, man, good to see you. Nobody pulled out a calendar and said, yeah, when do, what, what works for you? This is code. That whole, that whole interaction is code for, I get credit for the invite, but we don't actually have to do it. Right? We've all had that experience. Here's what happens when we invite people to church sometimes. Hey, uh, I would love, man, you guys go to that church? We got a mailer from that. Yeah, man, uh, I would love, yeah, you should check it out sometime. Yeah, I think we'll do that sometime. Great. And it's like, oh, I invited somebody to church. And yet, there was nothing specific. Here's how you invite someone. They got a mailer and you're like, oh, man, uh, yeah, we go to that church. In fact, I know, like, for us in our marriage, man, Marriage can be tough, and we want to get it right, and our church just wants to help. Why don't you come sit with me? Hey, we're going to the 11 o'clock service. Why don't you come sit with me? Hey, we're going to the 8 o'clock service. Why don't you come sit with me? That's a specific invitation. Hey, come and sit with me. And, and, and oftentimes, it takes people three to five invitations before they will ever say yes to going to church. All the, all the research says they need multiple invitations. And, and then finally, they go, well, I, yeah, I got a mailer from that church. Yeah, I got 17 mailers from that church keep telling them to take me off that mailing list, but they just keep showing up in the mailbox. I've heard of that church. I've wanted to check that out. Oh, well, our family's going to this service. Why don't you come sit with me? That's a a specific invitation. And if you're a part of the larger group of people that you're like, I'm pumped for this series, would you do the same thing? Would you extend a specific invitation to somebody? And you never know what hangs in the balance of your decision to invite someone. It might change their life. And it's possible this is how it happened for you because somebody invited you and you showed up and you walked through the doors. And when you invite a friend, can I tell you what happens? You evaluate everything through a different lens. You're like, oh man, I hope the music's not too loud. I hope the music's not too long. I hope the music's not too short. I hope Jeremiah doesn't say something weird. <laughs> and then when something happens and you're like, oh, I wish they didn't do that, then you, you'll either send me an email at the end of the day and go, that was so great. I brought my friends. I'm so excited. Or you'll send me an email and say, fix it. And I love those emails because you're evaluating the service the same way that we do. We want to make it. But you can't invite if you aren't coming. So for some of us, it's time to re-engage and invite friends and show up and have them sit with us. Extend a specific invitation. Number two, uh, join a small group. Participate in a small group. Now, I'll fly through this. We have a couple minutes here. This is what makes the church continue to be personal and practical and human even as we grow larger. We never set out in the beginning and said, hey, the mission of the church is to grow a large church. Never the mission. The mission is helping people find and follow Jesus. But when you do that in a growing area, then the church grows. And every once in a while, I get these comments from people. They go, I like it so much when the church was smaller. 
And then I go, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> They're letting everybody in. It's crazy. But what you'll notice is nobody ever says that when they haven't been. Nobody on the outside goes, ah, I would love it if your church was smaller and just left me out. It's always people on the inside who go, I wish it was smaller. I liked it when it met my needs, but, I, you know, not these guys and those guys. I mean, it's just too many people. But come on, you know this is true. You're smart enough to know if we're going to be on mission in a growing community, we're going to be a growing church. And it's going to get bigger. That's not the goal, but it's just a natural byproduct of staying on mission and staying on message. And so small groups are how we keep a large church personal and human. You don't have to know everybody, but you should know somebody. And here's what happens. Sometimes you're in a small group and somebody leaves that small group and somebody moves out of state and somebody else joins a different small group and somebody starts coming and you're kind of, your group kind of fizzles out and you go, well, we tried it, didn't work. But you had a bad haircut once. <laughs> you still get your haircut, right? You had a bad pizza once. You didn't ride off pizza. So come on. Community is not something you try once. It's something you do. It's something you commit to. If you had a bumpy group experience, you don't give up on community. You find another group. And I totally get it. Sometimes people go, well, I've been in a group for like three years, and it's great, but it's, God, it's kind of starting to feel a little generic. It's kind of like kind of a little vanilla. And listen, I totally understand, all right? I'm a professional Christian, okay? And I get it. I've been in small groups for 17 years, 27 years. I've been in doing small groups. But here's the truth. If you're feeling that way, like, man, it's starting to feel just a tiny bit stale for me, it's not time to leave. That's not the time to leave your small group. That's the time to lead a small group. We need you to step in and go, man, I could create environments for other people who need this. Because the value in small groups is not that I, I leave a Bible scholar. It's that I actually have community with people who know me and I know them. And together, we help each other move forward in our walk with Jesus. And there's people there that they know my story and they know my name. They know my family and they can encourage me. And we help push and pull and prod and strengthen and encourage and challenge each other as we move forward in following Jesus. And so maybe it's time to leave the small group. And we've got a lot of young families that want to jump into a small group, but we don't have as many small group, young family, small group leaders. Maybe it's time to say, yeah, I want to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll create a space where we can lead a small group for young families. Here's number three. Say yes to a serving team. Uh, the body of Christ is made up of different parts, but all of the parts have to work together for it to work. And if you're missing, then we're not complete. And when people walk through our doors and someone waves at them and someone greets them and uh, they get a cup of coffee and kids get checked in and there's people holding babies and there's people back hanging out with sixth through eighth graders, God bless those people. And uh, it's just, they're all volunteers, people who just said yes. And here's the truth. I know the pushback to this. I, I, I get it. Man, my life is so busy. Can I tell you something? This church was built with busy people. Every person is busy. If we waited for people who weren't busy so that we could do things, we would never do anything. Life is busy. And so here's the deal. Busy people simply said, I'm going to make myself available. I'm going to carve out some time, and I'm going to make myself available. So today, in our lobby, right outside, we have a whole big board that says, say yes. And the goal with that is that you would maybe look at some of those things and go, Here's, here's a serving team that I, I'd be interested in. I could jump into that. I'm going to say yes to that. And then someone from our team will call you this week and help you get plugged into that team. So today, all you got to do is fill out a card and say, hey, give me information about that. I think I could do that. I think I'll make myself available because even though my life is busy, I will carve out some time. I'll make myself available, and I'm interested in that. The church moves forward when collectively each of us does our part. And... You know, we, we all have a different role to play. And when we say, man, I'm in, I'll make myself available, God's church moves forward. Would you consider saying yes to a volunteer team? Number four, give generously. Uh, I, I won't spend much time on this, but there's no other investment that you can make with your money that is a better return on investment. And we give to God, not so that he'll bless us, but because he's already blessed us, right? And he is the owner of everything. And we return to him a percentage of what he's entrusted to us. And when, when we do that, here's what happens. The church moves forward and your faith grows. And that's what happens. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And when you invest 
in God's kingdom, when you invest in your local church, not only are you more invested in the body of Christ, but your faith in God begins to grow. I've never been more excited about the future of the church that Jesus started, and I've never been more excited about the future of Westbridge Church, and I want you to share in that excitement. And for those of you who are already engaged in a huge way, please hear me say thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those of you who have grown a little bit content to maybe just consume content, I want to invite you to re-engage, to participate in a level that maybe you haven't before. Now, historically speaking, the Jesus movement, this movement that Jesus launched, it should have died with its founder. That's what should have happened. And yet here we are 2,000 years later. And John, one of Jesus' disciples, he would say it this way, the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus launched this movement. The darkness hasn't overcome it. So let's make sure the darkness doesn't overcome it in our generation, in our community. Let's make sure it doesn't happen on our watch because the church of Jesus is worth it and you won't regret it. And the faith of the next generation depends on it. So let's do this. And if you're here today and you're like, man, I'm just, I just wandered in here today and I'm just kind of exploring this thing. You got to peek behind the curtain today. And here's what you need to know. The God of the universe created you and loves you and has invited you to be a part of his family, not based on anything you've done, but based on who he is. If you've never said yes to the invitation to be a part of God's family, I want to invite you to say yes. And you don't behave your way in or you don't earn your way in. It's just an invitation that God's extended to you. And I want to invite you to do that by just agreeing with this closing prayer. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times I've walked away from you. I'm so grateful you never walk away from me. And I want to say yes to your invitation. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to put my trust in you, to follow you as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, I pray for every one of us. We are the body of Christ. We are connected to each other through Jesus. And so may we engage, may we lean in, may we participate. And as we do that, I pray that this local expression, this local body of Christ would make a difference in our neighborhoods, in our community, and in our part of the world, that we would be the light that points other people to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.